So good morning. Uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us uh, this late morning uh, in York or in, uh, in anywhere in the world. It's quite a pleasure and an honor to introduce you our keynote speaker, uh, Beatrice uh, uh, Hauser. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, all of you online uh, and uh, to our professor Beatrice as our keynote speaker. She will be speaking uh, to us from Hamburg uh, where she's doing research this summer at the Bundeswehr Leadership Academy. Uh, professor Hauser has had numerous visiting professorships across Europe, including at the Russian Foreign Ministry's University in the United Kingdom, uh, she has taught at Reading University and King's College London. Presently, she's a professor at the University of Glasgow. We were particularly keen to hear from Professor uh, Hauser at our conference. Um, I mean, we will be particularly keen to hear from uh, Professor Hauser at our conference because of the new centrality of war, uh, uh, return to an age of conquest in the view of, um, of many. In fact, uh, Professor Beatrice has had a distinguished reputation for several decades as one of the leading historians of war, uh, a reputation that has been built up by impressive and wide ranging books. Um, the most recent one, a 2022 uh, book on war, a genealogy of Western ideas and practices. Professor Beatrice will talk about the book as well, but I think it's also important to mention another book from 2010 entitled The Evolution of Strategic Thinking, War from Antiquity to the Present. Uh, Professor Ozer also writes about the contemporary military scene. This, of course, for the public and academics across Europe and the world, a topic that many of us are watching with intense interest and concern nowadays with the current geopolitical situation in the um, European, uh, in the West uh, uh, European. Um, before I give the floor to Professor Beatrice, let me just uh, once again congratulate uh, um, these, uh, the, the conference organizers uh, in the name of uh, Osgur, but also uh, Raman. Um, in fact, uh, IEPAS uh, is also um, a very important conference for me and for the Portuguese friends, since we have been hosting this conference for some years, um, and we are looking forward to have you again in Lisbon. But this year in New York, we just wish that all the conference was just a big success, and that the most important, the discussion of the topics of Eurasia, was actually quite fruitful. So again, it's also a privilege for me to be here in this uh, uh, moderation uh, um, role. Thanks also for that opportunity. With no further ado, I give the floor to Professor Beatrice Hauser's remarks on Western conceptions of war with great anticipation. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, and I do very much wish I could have been with you, but we have spent this entire week on the new NATO strategic concept at Hamburg and also on the uh, European strategic compass, so I'm afraid I wasn't able to uh, join anything else. Uh, I really wish particularly I could have joined the sessions on Ukraine, but perhaps we can uh, discuss a little at the end. May I just ask for instructions again? Um, we have scheduled an hour for this. Does that, that con include something like 10 minutes of Q&A at the end, or do you try to, if, if possible? Okay, so I'll try to keep my, my own uh, contribution pithy and short, and I'm going moving on. Uh, can you see my screen? And I'm going to go into presentation mode, if I can make we, it. We are already uh, watching your screen, Professor. Okay, yeah. can you see now, now the perfect. presentation, presentation perfect, mode? Yeah. yeah? Yes. Okay, I um, committed myself to telling you a little bit about um, the findings of my most recent book, uh, which concerned particularly strengths and weaknesses of Western ideas about war and warfare. And this, of course, comes from my book that has been already been mentioned, uh, which is looking not only at ideas, but also at the background of practices, which I found very important to do because the ideas are very often much more civilized than the practice has been. So don't throw out the baby with the bath bathwater by saying Western practice has been horrendous in many periods uh, because some, some there has been more progress and more good things done by some of the Western ideas. Having said that, there are in fact several traditions, as we will see in a moment. There are several traditions of Western ideas about war, um, some of which are totally appalling. 
I'd just like to comment on the title page uh, that I've chosen for this book uh, by Vasily Veryachin, uh, who was a Russian painter of the 19th century who traveled along with the Russian forces to Central Asia when they were conquered and included into the Russian Empire. Uh, he had an exhibition of his works in St. Petersburg in 18, the 1880s, I think, early 1880s. The uh, organizers of this exhibition refused to exhibit this particular painting, which is called An Apotheosis of War. And it is dedicated to all dictators, past, present, and future. So this in itself shows actually, well, we're talking about Russia, and there's lots of debate about whether Russia belongs to a Western tradition or not. Uh, I would very strongly and firmly say it does, because unfortunately, Russia also contains within itself the worst and the best of the tradition. So you have somebody like Vershchagin, who was clearly against war. Uh, you had somebody like Tolstoy, one of the lead figures of pacifism. But you also had a pretty appalling tradition uh, that could be uh, is accumulating at the moment, or if it's showing itself at the moment in the aggressive war against Ukraine. So here's the structure uh, of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, several ideas or uh, clusters of ideas, one about the state, one about war and peace, the sort of dualism of war and peace, one about the question of how war has evolved, one about battles and sieges, one about dialectics and differences perhaps between the West and other countries. And if I can get around to it, depending on how fast I speak, uh, it's going to be a little a methodological um, epilogue at the end, but I might drop that in favor of discussion if I am running late. So let's talk about something that is particularly European and Western, namely the state-centric definitions of war, in which Western views of actors have always been that they had to be state. We even find this with Cicero, who has distinguished between a legitimate and an illegitimate adversary. Uh, the only legitimate adversary would be what I will call a state, because he had several categories, several criteria which had to apply for an adversary to be legitimate, and that had to include that one had to have a treasury, that one had to have an authority that could declare war, a senate house, curious uh, ideas, but all of which seem to be appertained to statehood. And that meant that insurgents or separatists in that whole tradition are seen as non sorry, seen as illegitimate adversaries. And for Cicero in particular, pirates, and pirates included robbers also on land, but mainly at sea, uh, and criminals, um, they were definitely not uh, uh, legitimate actors. In fact, they were described as public enemies, enemies of the public. This tradition goes all the way from pagan Rome, therefore, to international humanitarian law today, which is based on that Western tradition where state actors only are uh, recognized as legitimate actors. And even there, they are, of course, restricted in their ability to use force legitimately. Yet the UN, in restricting this ability, uh, at the same time, only recognizes states as members and only states can bring matters to the attention of the United Nations Security Council. So it's still we're still in a very, very state centric world. Um, this has advantages of a sort of legal approach. You can get a handle on this. You can hold states responsible for their actions. You can hold states responsible for the actions of their armed forces, as long as those are legitimately contracted by the state. You can take the states to the International Court of Justice, and if they do not comply, uh, the international community knows against whom to act, because there is an assumption, of course, that the state has territory, so you can physically act against them in some fashion. It has, however, got the great weakness that it excludes lots and lots of different sorts of war. Here again, the way in which it's focused on um, that it's war and the definitions of war and thinking about war are focused on the state. You've got an 18th century example where the Comte de Tressan in the en famous encyclopedia of Diderot d'Alembert said that war was a quarrel between princes or states decided by force or the means of arms. Um, it's nothing else, nothing else counts. Or Lassa Oppenheim very famously, even on the eve of the First World War, thought that war is a contention between two or more states through their armed forces. And this doesn't really fit the reality 
um, of warfare because warfare is much more complex than that. Uh, as I will argue in a moment, ever always has been. There's been an amazing article in the Marine Corps Gazette of 1989, so written just at the end of the Cold War, and yet so very, very um, um, insightful, not only for the present, but also if you look at the, the evolution of war in over many, many centuries, indeed two and a half millennia or so, where um, these five men, uh, all men, uh, who were active soldiers, but also one of them a political scientist, and if I remember correctly, one of them was a, a lawyer, uh, said that one had to rethink war, and this hence this idea that they put forward of fourth generation warfare, and they thought exclusively about how war was going to evolve in the near future, but in fact what they're describing actually fits a much, much larger pattern, where they said, our national security capabilities are designed to operate within a nation state framework. Outside that framework, we have great difficulties. And they observed that there were so many other actors, such, such as drag cartels, but also terrorists, who have non national or a transnational base. And in the case of terrorists, had an international ideology or religion. So something that goes beyond the state, beyond state boundaries, and for which they were complaining in particular that US forces were ill adapted. If you look at the reality of warfare, in fact, this pattern is much, much older. It's not just a question of new wars as they have come started to take place since the end of the Cold War. But in ancient Greece, uh, there was war between and within city states, uh, between city states and kingdoms, but also against outside polities. War existed on all levels and included insurgencies, slave riots, and things like that. Uh, the same is true for Rome, the new civil wars and insurgencies by slaves, by colonized peoples, against client states, that's, so that would be not amongst equals, and then external entities and tribes. The Middle Ages, in fact, went so far as to have private war almost emancipated alongside war amongst princes or polities, and then war against the external aggressors. So even a, for a very long time, um, although there was a tendency that to, to, uh, over 300 years to try to concentrate the legitimate authority to wage war exclusively in the hands of one central authority within polities that were increasingly becoming states, in fact, private war was accepted and was really happening at the same level or the same level of intensity and the same uh, frequency, if not more frequently, um, uh, throughout the Middle Ages until really um, the 15th, almost the 16th century, alongside a state a wars between polities. Early modern history knew its share of social uprisings, of religious wars, which of course were where ideology crossed, uh, cut across state boundaries. And then afterwards, colonial wars, which are not proper interstate wars either. Uh, and since 1917, at the very latest, there has been such a thing as gray zone warfare. Uh, the definition by Chatham House of the Cold War, you should remember, was all mischief short of war which means that this is not a total innovation, although this is constantly heralded as something. Uh, the only addition that you have today is the cyber element in warfare uh, that has made the gray zone warfare something that has penetrated more spheres. But the idea that there is something that is sort of falling short of properly declared war, kinetic war, but already does a lot of harm, is something that we've had at the very, very least since the propaganda warfare that came along with the Russian Revolution. Now, why is this um, legitimate authority um, thing so important? Uh, it's something that we find stressed by legitimate authorities, by authorities that did not want to accept anybody else's legitimate authorities. All the way back to uh, the earliest inscriptions we find in Middle Eastern uh, stone carvings, etc. Uh, and in fact, until the Geneva Conventions of 1949, rebels were treated as outlaws and were denied the right to be treated in any way as peers of states. And it's really only in the 1977 annexes of the Geneva Convention that you have the term war replaced by armed conflict for the very purpose of being able to include insurgencies as long as multiple conditions are met. 
the importance about this is that there's been a bit of a change in people's thinking about rebels and insurgents in the Second World War, because the Second World War experience, particularly in Europe, was that there were lots of insurgencies going on, there were lots of rebellions going on, and there was the resistance going on against the German Nazi oppressors. And all of a sudden, for uh, the allied countries, the idea that this might be something that could be positive rather than just negative, uh, gradually crept into their thinking. So uh, the people who rose up against the Wehrmacht, against the Nazi Germany, were perhaps the good on the good side. So one should somehow make allowances for them. One should somehow say that they might have justice on their side and therefore integrate that in some way into um, international humanitarian law. The problem is, however, that these conditions that are imposed on rebels are themselves very difficult to, um, to meet because they have to show themselves in some way as combatants and they have to therefore be distinguishable, all of which is very difficult if they're in a minority and if they're fighting uh, state powers and state armed forces. And there's another problem, which is that there is a systematic overlap between insurgencies and organized crime for the very reason that states tend to try to deny rebels access to the need, things they need, such as arms, even food, um, a, a fuel, all these things, which means that there, is, there tends to be a somewhat a blurred line between um, rebellious groups, insurgent groups and organized crime, because they have to turn to the black market to procure these things and increasingly become contaminated by those contacts. And then there is also the problem that we have uh, the rise of international organized crime, not that it hasn't been there before, but it is becoming stronger, more powerful, and it is uh, getting, putting, getting its hands on more means to pursue its activities, uh, more uh, armed uh, weapon systems, etc., which means that there has this whole category of enemies that is very difficult to accommodate in international law, I'm not saying that one should necessarily change international law to protect organized crime, but I'm saying that if you want to understand warfare and war from uh, the side of the anthropologist or the, or the sociologist, or even from those who devise strategies in war, i.e. from strategic studies, you have a problem if you do not, if you exclude that systematically from your study of war, because there's so much overlap, the, the, the boundaries are so blurred. If you're looking in particularly at conflicts since the 1990s and future conflicts, you have seen that there has been the, the number of intestine, i.e. intrastate wars has been on the rise again. It's it not, this is not totally new. This is not totally new, but it's been, it's been an up and down throughout history, but we're having, we're seeing a rise again of that. Um, we've seen, as I've already mentioned, the growth of international organized crime on the state uh, where they can conduct military operations on the scale almost of small states. And uh, we have um, the, this, this blurred line that I've already mentioned. Um, importantly, incidentally, that organized crime and mafias, etc., uh, see themselves as, in some respect, legitimate as also of providers of order and security for those who support them. So there is a self-perception of something that is a force of order and a force of good. You can't ignore that if you're trying to try uh, to address the root causes of these. So basically, you have more and more um, overlap between. Um, organized crime and political uh, non-state activities. Let's talk, look at the adversarial combatants today. Um, this is to go back to, to go to another study by an eyewitness. This is Brigadier Ben Barry in his book, Blood, Metal and Dust, judging the, his own experience of Afghanistan and Iraq where he notes that the complexity in Iraq resulted from the diversity and the overlap between armed actors. For example, said he in Iraq from the mid 2003 onwards, there was a great deal of overlap between militias and organized criminal groups, as well as political and religious extremists and death squads. In both wars, smuggling, blackmail, protection rackets and organized crimes often funded malign political and military activity. So here again, somebody who has found exactly the same thing in his in-depth uh, experience of Iraq and Afghanistan, while I had deduced all this from my armchair strategi strategist's point of view and reading of the literature. 
Um, we are again, I think, in danger of falling into a trap of thinking the, the, of the world as an either or, as though there was either asymmetric warfare involving non-state actors or else major war between state actors. And the, it's, it's simply um, the our armed forces, for example, for the last couple of decades have excessively concentrated on one at the expense of the other, uh, so that everybody around the globe now, all the armed forces are saying, oh my goodness, we have to refocus, we have to look more at major war. Um, but then the means tend to be limited and it's you people go for an either or. They either look at war, at limited war or um, intervention you know, war, or they look at major war. And it's actually both. We'll continue to see both going on. Let's look at this idea of whether war or peace is the norm. And this is again, um, this is the bit where it is very important to understand that there are very roughly spoken two competing Western traditions. There is actually a tradition that sees war as the norm, that war as something that dominates the world and dominates the social life among uh, states. You see Plato saying that what most people call peace is nothing but a word, and in fact, every city-state is at all times by nature in a condition of undeclared war with every other city-state. And the, only the ignorant masses do not realize that everyone throughout his life is always engaged in a continuous war against all the other city-states. So this idea that there is at least a latent war going on at all times that can break into kinetic war at any time. Emperor Augustus told us that in, uh, the, in the whole period of Roman history, in the 750 years before his own reign, there was only peace twice, while in his own reign there was peace three times, and peace in Rome was symbolized by the temple of Janus closing its doors. So this seems to indicate that for Rome, war was the norm, peace the exception. In early medieval Europe, you could find almost annual military campaigns. People did the harvest and then they went on campaign. You know, this was a sort of classic thing. 15th of, March, of August is usually when people went on campaign. Uh, and we find a famous quotation by the British uh, lawyer, Sir Henry James Sumner Main, who said, uh, claimed that war was as old as mankind, but peace a modern invention. This idea of war being the norm, of course, is strongly, strongly uh, included in the realist thinking, which you can trace back particularly to German thinkers of the mid and late 19th century. Those are the archetypical realists. Um, there is the German biologist Ernst Haeckel, who thought that it was a thing of nature. Uh, this is, of course, where Darwinism crept in. Uh, nature is the fight of all against all. Nowhere in nature does that idyllic peace exist about which the poets sing. Instead, everywhere there is fighting and the striving to destroy one's neighbors and to destroy one's uh, neighbors direct, uh, one's direct adversary. Uh, Moltke, the elder, uh, famously had this thing about uh, how peace was a, a bad dream uh, and human life and indeed, all of nature is a battle of that which is in existence against that is becoming that is coming into existence. Um, Friedrich von Bernardi, the natural law to which all laws of nature can be reduced is the law of struggle, and he thought it was a biological necessity. Here again, uh, that is the the, the bit about um, the social Darwinism being rampant at this stage. So basically, being a realist is being a social Darwinist. Um, but just let's remind ourselves about the difference between realism and naturalism. Uh, it's reflected also in art. Um, the painting on the left by George Gross is uh, referred to as realist. It is painting the world uglier than it really is. It's, it's underlining the ugliness of the world, whereas the painting on the right Unfortunately, it's not. It's more blurred than I had hoped. Um, which has this wonderful little fly sitting on the coif of that lady, painted by an anonymous Flemish painter, was trying to depict the world as closely as possible to the natural reality as it is. So realism is a um, sh shows the world in uglier ways than it really is. So I, I hate the way in which realism has captured the word and monopolizes this idea of real. Um, let's turn back to the Nazi thinkers and the, the way in which national socialist thinking was a culmination of this fusion of uh, extremely uh, skeptical political thinking and social Darwinism. 
um, where, uh, according to their uh, ideologue Carl Schmitt, all politics is about the confrontation between friend and foe. Then the foe does not have to be ugly, in, not, immoral, or uneconomical, but he's the other, the alien, who is essentially something other and alien. And the com concept of the foe goes along with the real possibility of a violent uh, conflict at all times. Therefore, he thought that the state needs the real option in a particular case by its own decision to identify a foe and a statum. Again, this fusion of statehood and the right to go and fight. You know, statehood is the ability and the, the, the need to go and fight uh, adversaries. So from that point of view, to go back to my, uh, the cover of my book, um, Russian realist thinkers were just very, very typically Western, in fact. The Imperial Russian General Genrik Antonovich Leir, who was the founder, I think, of the Russian Military Academy, um, as noted, this was when Darwinism was already spreading. On the way to a better civilization, it would be very desirable to avoid war, but we can hope that this will uh, only be in the distant future. And this is a dream at that stage. So on the one hand, it would be nice if we could get rid of war, but this would be in the distant future, not in immediate reality. And then in the, ninth, in the 20th century, the Russian exile, Anton Antonovich Kersnovsky said, while peace is the natural state of humanity, ha, he, uh, uh, he said, ironically, humanity had to become extinct for its main disease, war, to die out. So that basically the two of them would coexist. And Evgeny Edvardovich Messner in the late 50s was seen, saw war as a struggle for existence and as God given. So basically, those are simple continuations of the realist thinking of the 19th century. And that's what we find found in Putin's speech in the World Economic Forum in January 2021, where he said, we all know the competition and rivalry between countries in world history never stopped, does not stop and will never stop. Differences and the clash of interests are also natural for such a complicated body as human civilization. On that particular occasion, he then added that yeah, there was, was some space for um, pooling one's efforts to fight climate change, etc. But the most important part of this is really that his, he sees the world as a realist, as one in which competition and fighting is the natural condition. Um, Indeed, one can add that warlords, dictators, and authoritarian regimes benefit from incessant conflict. As an author who was a contemporary of Clausewitz's, whom I admire particularly, already said around the time of the Napoleonic Wars, or just coming out of the Napoleonic Wars, where he said, there are other contexts in which a state derives some substantial or perhaps only imaginary gains from the continuation of war. There are contexts in which they derive gains. In such cases, war is by no means waged for the sake of peace, as this would be a quite undesired event, but for the sake of the hoped for gains to be achieved through war. Such wars include those that are waged for passion and personal interests of individual military men of officials, of the army, in short, because of some subordinate interest, but not the general welfare of the state. He'd originally said uh, that there, this war should really be fought in order to do, uh, arrive at a better peace that would benefit everybody. But then he said, um, it's it, very importantly that states um, derive a substantial, and let me stress this again, or perhaps only imaginary gains from the continuation of war. And that's where we get into perceptions and ob subjective perceptions, a state, a leader of a state, um, those, individual military men or officials, and in fact, um, presidents and dictators, etc., may imagine that there is a gains to be made from the continuation of war, even if other, other parties would not see it like that. Here is Western tradition B, which is developed alongside this war-centric tradition, and which has seen peace as the norm and war as the transgression. Again, we find a passage in Plato where this seems to be uh, underlying this passage, um, where he said that the lawgiver should legislate the things of war for the sake of peace rather than the things of peace for the sake of well, what pertains to war, which seems to suggest that one should assume that peace is the norm, contrary to the passage I quoted earlier. And of course, there was from Augustus onwards, the Roman idea of the Pax Romana, the idea that there should be peace within the polity, even if one couldn't stop 
nasty invaders from coming at the Roman Empire from the outside. We find it in the League of Nations covenant, which says that the one is trying to promote international cooperation and to achieve international peace and security by the acceptance of obligations not to resort to war. So here the idea that one could establish, one hopes to establish international peace and security. And we find it in the UN Charter, where we, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, um, is the underlying assumption that, that peace is one is trying to um, put, uh, make the, 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 the status quo, sorry, the, the norm of international relations. It's interesting to see that this idea of a perpetual peace was not always there in Western thought, but it incredibly, incre increasingly, sorry, became part of a Western tradition. So, in fact, in ancient Greece, peace treaties were limited periods of truce. We know of a 30 years peace between Athens and Sparta, the truce of 423 between Athens and Sparta, the peace of Nikias, which was supposed to hold for 50 years, which is very, very long uh, in their own uh, perception, because at the time this would mean that would, would commit a success of generations. Um, and another, uh, then um, hundreds of years later, 700 or something years later, a 30 years truce between the um, Persia and, the, and Rome. In the Middle Ages, on the whole, it was the norm to say that treaties obtained only during the lifetime of signatories, which meant that whenever a signatory, normally kings, princes, um, a signatory of a treaty died, the successor or the other party to the treaty would go up to the successor and ask the successor to extend the validity of the treaty. Or the other way around, if the other side, for example, a, a, a baron died who had been granted land, um, his heir would have to go up to the person from whom he, the land had been granted and would have to ask for it to be continued. So treaties tended to obtain only during the lifetime of the signatories. Um, it's only in early modern history that this began to change. There was a curious treaty, very much a one-off in 1518, which was dubbed a perpetual peace outside conditions of war between three European princes, Henry VIII of England, François de France, and one other. Um, then there were gradually pieces that, peace treaty, sorry, that were um, concluded from the 16th century onwards, which contained, contained the clause perpetual peace. And you all know that from Kant's idea of the perpetual peace, but this is something that apparently only crept in from the 16th century onwards. Uh, you have to see in parallel to that a rather despondent attitude or rather pessimistic attitude to peace uh, in the main religions, where you had the Hebrew tradition that said that peace would only really be far found in paradise after the end of time, where God would be the judge between the nations, would arbitrate for many peoples, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, incidentally the statue on the left of course being one that you find in Moscow in front of the Tretyevkov's uh, gallery, so this is again a Russian uh, piece of art um, that uh, show that this tradition also exists in Russia. Um, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This idea that this would be an end state, a paradisical end state of society, which is, of course, something that Christianity and Islam, with their aim of achieving worldwide Christendom and worldwide Islam, uh, took up. You know, But for them, again, it was something that was seen only at an end state when real the real world was a strife. You see this in uh, St. Augustine of Pippo's uh, Chividas Dei, in which it's only in the uh, otherworldly uh, Jerusalem that you'd have per perpetual peace, whereas in our own life we could not hope for that. And of course, you get this translated one to one into the Marxist Leninist view, in which only an end state would be that of peaceful world communism. Uh, is it goes together with some Western idea of progress and this faith in a linear development of history in which gradually uh, peace would be established, which seems to be quite different 
from ideas of the world and of time in other civilizations, just to pick out the most famous here, uh, the cyclical world views of history that you find in the Chinese of the yin and yang tradition, where one is always becoming the other and the always becoming um, and uh, this perpetually turning around without both being completely distinct. There is not this idea of a completely distinct dualism that we have in the Greco-Roman Western tradition, where one thing is extremely just white and the other one is just black, whereas in the yin-yang tradition, both contain elements of the other. Or here, of course, on the left, the Buddhist view, uh, real of life. Um, in Islam, incidentally, uh, peace, just to, to elaborate on that, peace was seen as finality. Uh, but it was interesting that peace treaties with non-Muslims were prohibited, there could only be truces, so that you find this whole series of uh, truces that were concluded in this, from the 16th century onwards with rather very, a number of Western polities, when it is only uh, in 1699 that there was the Peace of Karlovitz between the Ottoman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, in which for the first time the Ottoman Empire concluded a peace that was not limited in time, i.e. it was not a, a truce. And this is normally seen as the time when the Ottoman Empire entered into the Western powers, great power configuration. Okay, um, let's look at ideas about the evolution of warfare. Uh, where I've already indicated with my little scheme of the, the, the ape to human uh, that we have, we're very addicted to the idea of a linear evolution of warfare, where we think of war something, something that becomes ever more lethal, that will be ever more global, hence this trend towards world wars when there couldn't be world wars before the whole world hadn't been discovered by each other, as it were, um, ever more uh, dominated by technology, perhaps, but on the other hand, it is hope that it should be ever more humane, constrained by international humanitarian law. Uh, but that this is not the case uh, was discovered, as, at least at the very latest, by Clausewitz, who wrote in his on war, uh, retrospectively about the Napoleonic Wars, that war had attained its absolute force, yet, he thought, it was no more likely that war will always be so monumental in character than that the barriers which have been broken will be totally re-established. And he therefore um, discovered for himself that war was evolving in a non-linear fashion, i.e. it was not simply going from limited to ever stronger, but that it was a chameleon that would adapt to all sorts of different contexts and might be stronger or might be weaker. In the Western tradition, uh, there have been patterns that, of warfare that can be observed, which have been promoted in a way. Um, we have on the one side the tradition of Achilles, you might say, um, the reliance on muscle, the reliance later on ex explosive power, firepower, uh, increasing all the way from the 13th century, then to the nuclear age with ever greater destructiveness. And then at the end, uh, overlapping with the age of machine warfare from the 19th century to the present as opposed to the tradition of Odysseus, um, which tried to, to make use of asymmetric, asymmetric strengths. Um, and in fact, when you're looking at the development of Western war, you will see that that existed throughout. And today we have another trend which is, has come into place since the 1960s, enabled through technology, namely the att attempts to contain war through greater control and greater precision, which is something that simply wasn't there in previous centuries. But this idea of the um, Achilles way of war being victory through superior strength is something that has given rise to the idea that this is a, a Western way of war. You find that in Victor Davis Hansen's idea, writing, the idea that, that there is a direct, has to be a direct confrontation, that battle is somehow heroic and central, unavoidable, uh, but also a horrible tradition, which is, somehow argues that one can only get to triumph through sacrifice, which is a very, very Christian thing, um, but also partly rooted in, in parallel Greek ideas or Roman ideas that you go through diversity to the stars per aspera or per ardua ad astra, motto of the RAF and of the Prussian state, uh, which is very strongly um, entrenched in Russian culture, where there's this, this emphasis in the culture of uh, the necessity for collective sacrifice without which you're not going to merit 
victory. You have to have the moral superiority that is given by sacrifice, and that then, and only that entitles you in the end to triumph and victory. Um, a rather horrible uh, tradition on which dictators can draw in order to uh, use the patience of the Russian people inspired by this culture and this tradition in order to do all sorts of ghastly things. The Odysseus way of war that is thereby outsmarting the enemy on the whole has not been given enough recognition in writing about the Western traditions. Uh, but in any case, they can be traced very, very far back in, in terms of ruses and intelligence. But they are very much also part of other cultures, traditions, uh, the Chinese tradition, where Sun Tzu, of course, famously said that the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without fighting, etc., etc., just to keep that short. But really the idea that without victory, without fighting, something that you find in the 18th century, very likely without any direct influence or knowledge of Sun Tzu, you find that in the early 18th century, in the writings of Maurice de Saxe, who was one of the marshals of the French King Louis XV, who said that your ideal victory would be won without fighting. How does new technology uh, impact on all that? Well, um, I said since the 1960s, there's this quest for greater precision. Um, there is this ideal of an, a bloodless manipulation of the enemy by cyber means and art, artificial intelligence as well. Now, the question there is, whom does this really mainly benefit? Does this really benefit mainly the developed states? Well, it certainly benefits states that have got clever uh, IT people somewhere. Uh, having said that, a lot of the new technologies, I would argue, um, also, and sorry, not only I, lots of um, future forecasts uh, argue uh, of, by, by people who are much more informed than I am, um, that several of the new technologies are easily affordable by non-state actors. And on the right hand side, at the top, I've shown the picture there of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, just to show how clever and versatile um, uh, parties can uh, try to circumvent a direct, this Achilles type approach of superior Western powers, militarily superior Western powers, by finding means of getting around them here with bicycles, of course, famously the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, to get around the way in which the American armed forces tried to block the communication along uh, throughout uh, um, Vietnam through, between North and South. So in a similar way, uh, you can find that um, technologies now are being can be used in a very smart way by otherwise inferior adversaries against the West. So particularly new technologies from cyber to drones very often uh, are in their unattributable um, character can benefit non-state actors. Um, they also will benefit international organized crime, which is why I have shown, shown the picture on the bottom right hand side, which seems to be a Mexican card, drug cartels attack on a, a munitions depot uh, carried out with a drone. Um, one of the things that the West is particularly obsessed with is this idea that warfare is really all around heroic battle, when in fact, uh, Professor, all... to... yes, sorry, sorry to interrupt, just to um, tell you that we still have uh, around 15 minutes, so um, we look forward, of course, to to hear from you, but also if you want to have some Q&A, um, just be sure that uh, it's now quarter to one. I was going to stop at 10 to one. Yes, perfect. Is that okay? Sorry. Yes. Okay. British punctuality then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I was going to say that basically civilians have been much more involved in warfare than has been on the whole um, accounted for in the Western narrative and Western perceptions of war. Uh, and that again is something I was going to bring into it very briefly, that it's only quite late on that with the Geneva Conventions, um, the idea of bombing civilian targets has been from the air has become something that has been criminalized. Uh, let me just um, say again, turn again to this marvelous article by Lynn Nightingale, Smith, Sutton and Wilson which had already in 1989 said that the distinction between civilian and military that was entrenched in this nice way in the Geneva Conventions um, would is likely now to be undercut again. And we again turning to Ben Barry with his work on Iraq and on Afghanistan, uh, where he said, after the defeat of Saddam's regime, most combat in Iraq 
Wasn't the towns and cities reflecting the political importance of the settlements where most of the Iraqi people lived? Afghanistan was much less urbanized nation, but combat still revolved around towns, villages, farms, and compounds. So very much something that will affect and continue to affect civilians. And just on that note, uh, in the Führungs Academy of the Bundeswehr, we've just been shown the latest tank acquired by the Bundeswehr which has got a, a, a camouflage uh, that is designed specifically for urban warfare and no longer inspired by, uh, by vegetation, but by uh, symmetrical designs. Um, I will leave out my very last bit, but I will bring in this idea of binaries and dialectics. Uh, which I think is really something that distinguishes Western approaches very strongly from Eastern approaches, um, where we see this very strong polarization around thinking that there's either war or peace, um, which is very much the legal approach, of course, because you need to know which law, laws apply. Are we now in a state of war or a state of peace? Um, it's also very binary about this idea of combatant versus civilian, where there are plenty of examples where it's, it's going to be difficult to distinguish between these two, not just for technological reasons, but also if civilians support insurgencies or combat of some sort. Um, then there is this binary, uh, binary between regular soldiers and rebels. Um, that we uh, are, which is again a legal imposition, if you like. And this idea of just one form of war, either proper classical major war versus irregular insurgency and rebellion. Um, it leaves out mercenaries, of which we're going to see more. And it also gives us this problem of how to identify um, an adversary or where to draw a line, um, particularly when we see a binary distinction between an adversary, a collective adversary, whom we see as um, uh, not only a, a combatant, but also somebody who's ideologically uh, hate inspired in an, in an idea of a battle of ideas in a different um, category. Um, where we don't actually know how to deal with the neutral population. Is the population actually neutral or is it siding with us or them? This is something that is uh, quite problematic for our conceptualization of war. I will skip the Chinese side because I really don't know enough uh, in order to be able to discuss that. I hope somebody else can do that in the discussion. Uh, but this idea of, again, the Hegelian dialectics is particularly Western. I've already talked about the difference between that and the uh, dialectics in, um, in the Chinese context. And um, just to uh, repeat this question of how in, in the West there is this, this, these binaries that, are, that we are obsessed with. Um, finally, we are particularly in military education obsessed with the categorization and compartmentalization of wars, where we try to think, we teach in military academies um, in different uh, as, uh, pigeonholes, if you like, small war and the many other terms that have been used for it, limited war, irregular war, insurgency, always a slightly different categorization, and quite separately, unlimited war, major war, etc. when the reality has always been that the two can go together. For example, all world wars contained small wars, insurgency, these resistance movements. And there again, one can show that in Russian and Chinese approaches, there's much more the uh, approach to say we will mix as appropriate. A Russian thinker, Nikolai Medem, already wrote that all great commanders were truly great because they based their actions on pre existing, not on pre existing rules, but on a skillful combination of all means and circumstances. And again, the two Chinese colonels who said something like that the more, most important thing, the winner in war would be the one who combined well. I come to my conclusion, which is very short. We have conceptual problems because warfare has not evolved in a linear fashion neither from limited to ever more lethal nor from cruel to ever more humane. The binaries that we need for international law are unhelpful to contextualize war. And the West is much more focused on Achilles and not enough on Odysseus on the whole. We see peace as the norm and want it as quickly as possible, but many other cultures do not. Um, and we uh, need to adapt to constant or recurrent long-term race zone strife, which is something that is not in our culture 
The question there will be whether the international humanitarian law can be adapted easily to non-state actors and Greystones Drive and to all the other things that are happening. And that we, on the other hand, need to adapt evolu to evolution within war, for as one war that it starts in one way can actually take many forms simultaneously. We have ethical problems with which I shall end. In order to uphold the international rules-based system, we do have to fight with one hand tied behind our backs because we then have to obey rules that our adversaries may not necessarily obey because that is the only way for us to keep the moral high ground and domestic and international opinion on our side we do not want warfare to affect civilians but in fact uh, there is it is a constant struggle for us to differentiate between innocents truly those who do not do harm, because that's what innocent means, and those who in some way contribute to the adversary's war effort. And just one more word about this idea of the rules-based international system. It is a system that protects civilians on all sides and that limits wars on all sides. And to go against that is to inflict self-harm, whoever it is. That's my 10 to two, and I finish on my talk there and I'm welcoming any questions and comments. Thank you so much, Professor. In fact, a quite sharp British punctuality. Um, it's now 10 to, uh, to 1. So that means that we still have some time for Q&A and for uh, um, having the opportunity to uh, hear from Professor Beatrice uh, more insights on this topic. Still, it was an excellent overview uh, on this topic, especially nowadays with this geopolitical uh, um, tension uh, in the West, in the Eastern borders of the European Union, um, and all these insights on the war and on the conflicts and on, and on this also on this balance between the ethical dimension, but also the the the, the most practical and the most uh, um, also military dimensions of this uh, of this subject is quite interesting. Uh, so it was a, an excellent overview, and we thank you very much, Professor, for this. Um, I will give the floor now to the audience. Uh, I personally have some questions, but still I would like to give the opportunity uh, for the audience. You can uh, raise your question uh, uh, on, the, on Zoom, or you can write down and, uh, and, and I can read for you. Professor Kenbooth, uh, would you uh, give the honors first, please? <laughs> Yes, you just have to mute the to, to turn uh, on the yeah. yes. It's perfect. Yeah, that was a that was that was a fantastic overview, and I certainly want to read the book. Um, you talked a lot about blurred boundaries, and the need you know, and that led to categorizations and all this uh, this stuff. I recently read an article an old article by W.B. Galley, uh, a philosopher, um, who said, uh, one, of, one of the problems we have when we think about violence, and I'm, I'm putting this in his words now, I think we should be talking more about political violence, perhaps, rather than war, because the problem with war is that the, the usage of the term comes from two quite different roots. There's the Latin root bellum, which leads to the Western way of war as, you know, the Clausewitzian warfare between combatants and, it, and you can then categorize types of war and so on. And the other um, term is, from Old High German, and I won't attempt to uh, pronounce it, but he spells it W-E-R-R-E. -E. And this is not about the sort of what calculating war between contestants, but it, it's all about disorder and the breakdown and suffering and so on. And, um, and we want to use this word war to cover this huge range of uh, political violence. And I wondered whether you'd come across Galley and what you thought about it. And is it better there to, to, to stop using the word war so much and talk about categories of political violence? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I like your idea of categories of political violence. I think that's a very good idea. Um, I just, as I did this very large um, overview, I used the uh, focus on whatever the terms were that they used, uh, that at the same time they thought as being translatable. And we have a problem with the Middle Ages when Vera, this idea, uh, this war comes in, this word for disorder and strife, uh, because it doesn't really map one to one onto a, a war as the, some of the people writing in Latin say, because they then use it side by side with Bellum to describe mainly internal disorder and war. Um, so in the Middle Ages, we have a non one to one uh, uh, mapping onto it. But then afterwards, the word war in English, of course, becomes the what is Bellum, you know, it's simply when you use, use uh, read your uh, De Bello Gallico, it's, it's uh, translated as the Gallic Wars. Um, you're absolutely right. And I need to uh, find out more about Galley, but you'll find a, a big chapter on these words in my book. Right, I saw the problems them. of using them, but I like the idea of political violence. Uh, but then it, it is probably sensible to start say it has to be sort of relatively organized, large scale, rather than in a sudden or um, a sudden uh, spontaneous violence. That Thank would you. be a cutoff point. You're very much encouraged to write to me. I've put my email in the chat box uh, for any other comments and questions and corrections. I'm very very grateful. Please do write to me. I'd be grateful. Yes, I was going to mention that Professor Beatrice has just uh, um, wrote in the chat uh, the email beatrice.user at uh, glasgow.ac.uk. We still have time for one more question, so we want to try um, and go forward. Dr. Kolontai seems to have unmuted herself. Is that boldly <laughs> working her way to a question? And it, it's um yes, yes thank you actually i'm thinking here but um it was um actually i wanted to just explore with you um your interpretation of the hebrew text uh beating plowshares uh beating swords into plowshares um because actually the dominant interpretation within jewish tradition is not about saying it's the doomsday the the end of judgment it's actually about god um, encouraging biblical Israel um, to uh, review and engage with how they're using their resources and their approaches. And overall, God is there um, in, in the context of the time saying, you know, you do need to behave differently and you must pursue peace. So I, I was just interested in, in where you'd sort of got your interpretation because it seems okay. to me it's a christianized interpretation yeah. i think that yeah. i think you're absolutely right i think you're absolutely right um i'd be very grateful if you could pop into an email um uh -huh. what you know about the hebrew uh, tr interpretation traditional hebrew interpretation of that yes. i'd be very grateful but as you know okay. in the christian kiliastic tradition it then becomes yeah. uh, the, the, the end of time really grateful for this comment i didn't know that and please let me know okay. yeah no thank you Thank you, Pauline. Uh, anyone else for a last comment? If not, I think you're, uh, all, you're all uh, short of time now for going into the next session, which I. The, the very, very large footsteps of Professor Booth, uh, but do write to me, I'd be grateful. Well, we are